Hi, my name is April Nace, and I'm here with Stephen Shaw to do an oral history on July 8th, 2015 at the Corning Museum of Glass. So to start off, Stephen, um, I'd just like to ask you a little bit about your yourself and your history, where you're from, where you grew up, um, a little bit of your background. All right. Uh, I'm Stephen Shaw, uh, born in Corning, New York. Uh, my father worked on the uh, old uh, lens for Palomar. Worked for Corning for quite a few years and then got a job on the railroad. Of course, I was born in 52. Uh, he had already had 300 children and uh, I was the baby. <laughs> um, I was, after the flood, I was given the opportunity to start at Corning on August 14th, 1972. I walked in at the end of the day. They said, follow me, let's go upstairs. Went up to John Phillips' office, at that time was the manager, and uh, Lady took my paperwork, says, okay, follow me, walk me into the hand shops, say you start here Monday morning, seven o'clock. Wow, wow, that, that's a pretty quick job interview. Yeah, I didn't anticipate it. Yeah, so well, what did they start you off doing? Uh, shop boy. What does that mean? Holding mold, cleaning the floor, uh, being a a helper mm -hmm. for a shop. And how long did you do that? For about a week and a half, almost two weeks. That's it? Yep. So what did they put you on next? Holding mold, mm -hmm. which was a hot mold, and the gaffer took a gob, uh, manipulated it, whether he cut it or swung it, and then put it in the mold, blew it up. How long did you do that? For about three months. So you moved pretty fast. Yes. Yeah. What What was your next job? A ball maker. And what does that entail? Um, we worked a system called German system, where what you did is you got a small gob of glass, you blocked it, blew it out, and it made a uniform ball. The ball was then cooled on a table, or the irons are cooled, and uh, rotated so it didn't lose its shape. And uh, a, a guy called a cover, or the next gather, would take and cover it up, bring it out, and block it. Give it to the gaffer. The gaffer would then take it, manipulate it, cut it, or whatever needed to be done, and blow it in the mold. Mm -hmm. So what were the, the end products from that? Uh, at that time, we were making radar bulbs. We worked on a furnace that was out back in C Factory. It was a government furnace. It was lead glass, uh, G8 it was called. High resolution, it was heavy, but it worked very slow. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about your, your career with Corning. What other jobs did you have? What kind of things did you do? I know you came to us, so we were really yes, interested yes. that you were excited to tell us your um, story. I was given opportunity to try different things. And while doing that, I ended up gaining job status. Um, I was hired in at the same time as four other guys, but I seemed to jump ahead because when I was given the opportunity, I took it. I was very lucky. The old men uh, wanted somebody to teach. And that was the biggest thing. They were my mentors. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me anything about them? Oh, yes. Uh, my first gaffer was Clarence Whitehead. 
He lived in Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania. I worked with him about three and a half, four months. Uh, my next gaffer was uh, Kenny Brockway. And we were all making the same jobs. We were doing it one shift, next shift, next shift. Worked uh, three shifts. So a lot of times you had to work midnight to eight. Uh, it was quite a process. We were making probably three to 500 pieces in eight hours. Wow. What kinds of things would those be? Uh, radar bulbs, uh, a lot of stuff for electronics. Um, then through the process, Somebody asked me, I had a supervisor, name was Vinny Soner, said, hey, would you like to learn how to gather on a hand press? I said, sure. <laughs> uh, then I went to a hand press, worked for an older man named Lloyd Lehman, uh, and it was a whole different process. Gathering on a clay head, dropping it off, they cut it with shears, and warm the molds up, and they slide the molds in by hand, hand press them. Uh, we made a lot of uh, electronics, lenses, different things like that. Wow. A lot of military stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense for around that time. Yeah, it was, I, very prevalent. Right. So what other what other kinds of things? I know you mentioned on the way over here, uh, flameware. Oh yes, uh, well, the hand shops would go down for about a month, month and a half to do repairs on their furnaces. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, hey, do you want to go to uh, flameware to work? So we went over and worked as shop boys. Um, in other words, I sat in the chair Watch the process. It was a drum-driven process. A gob would be cut off into a parison mold, be pressed, transferred, blown up, and then transferred out. Um, and what we would do as shop boys is, uh, for a half hour, you would handle wear by hand with tongs, and for the other part of that hour, you would watch the machine. So if they had a jam or a problem, you had a hook, you go over and you hook the hot glass out so it wouldn't double press, you know. Pretty unique. Yeah, yeah. So was there anything else that you did with um, Pyrex? Well, actually, I worked more soft glass and harder glass than Pyrex when I worked in B&C factory. I also worked on the hand tube shop, which we would draw tubing by hand or cane and then cut it off and they'd reprocess it. Uh, we worked in the old tower, which is being redone right now. Right, right. And uh, we actually, oh, I'd say the the gob we actually produced weighed about 45 to 60 pounds, depending on the glass material. We would actually take that, form it out by the pop furnace, had an old steel carp, steel wheels, roll it out, put it in the glory hole, stick it on a punny, and drag it up. And then you cut it off, cut it off as it came back down. So it was actually thermometer tubing and some other products. Mm -hmm. Probably medical, medical kinds all, of things. Yeah, I say all medical. Right, right. Yeah, everything that we made um, in the early days was either electronic or medical. Some military lenses, when I worked on a hand press, uh, we made things like, it was called Daylight Blue, used to be used on board of a uh, ship. 
when they put the lens in and turn it on, it casts like an eerie glow, but you could not see it from a distance. Very hard glass to work. Yeah. Very malleable. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so what are some of your favorite stories about working for Corning? I know that in interviewing other people, we've heard all kinds of stories, even people that cooked um, venison steaks in the Lear and yes, TV dinners we used and to, we all used kinds to do of venison stuff. venison steaks and uh, pizzas. <laughs> um, my plant manager was John Phillips. He had a brother who was one of our setup men, and he used to cook pizza for us. Good Italiano. And you guys want a sausage with that or whatever? And he'd take a chain. Of course, we had about eight layers. Take a chain, hook it on something, slide that pizza in, and let it go down. <laughs> the chain would hold it. He, he had his timing down, pull it back. <laughs> uh, something else we used to do is. Are you familiar with an old place called Antoinette's? It's on Denison Parkway. All the boys would get together. Everybody brought in a hunk of meat, some vegetables. We'd take it to Antoinette's in the morning, and she'd make pasta sauce for mm -hmm. us. So we'd go running over at lunchtime, eat the pasta, come back. Cool. Yeah, good home cooking. Yeah, I bet. Home cooking in um, the factory? Yes. <laughs> yes. So we worked hard. You got to figure, when I worked in beef factory, all I had was outside air uh, and a small cooling unit. But if the humidity was high, uh, it was unreal to work in. You go home at night, take your socks, throw them on the porch because they were just soaking wet. Mm. Everything was soaking wet. Right. You know, you sweat salt. Back in those days, they were into giving us salt tablets. Uh, later on, we got into Gatorade, other products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so tell me your favorite memories about working there. The uh, Handmade tubing, mm -hmm. um, making various things. Um, I worked for one gaffer uh, that we used to have what was called a, um, it was kind of like a temporary shop. You take good people who had application, uh, made the first handheld radar gun. Mm -hmm. We made the bulb. <laughs> um, we also made uh, the first digital watch crystals on the hand press. Wow. And what, when was that? It was in the 70s. The 70s? Yeah. When the B&C factory started to back off, the jobs were getting less and less. More automation coming up. I ended up moving to a factory, which was all bore silica. Worked on the first all-electric furnace. Wow. How did, how did it work? It worked excellent. But when you look into a, uh, an archway or a glory hole, uh, to see those electric bars glowing, they had a lot of radiation. Even with the air that we had, uh, if you put your arm up, it would take the fur right off. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of the jobs we did were work intensive. When we used to make 4,000 beakers, for example, in main plant, we'd make 12 to 1,500 in eight hours. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yes, it was. The um, one of the men I worked for, actually, his picture is on the tower. 
Oh yeah, who's that? Lido Kalakechi. That's that's quite a name. He came here in, when the depression was very high. Offered his services and they hired him on the spot. Very skilled man. Mm -hmm. How did he end up on the tower? Um, he was making a job called retorch, where you'd turn around and start the gob. It would have a ball on the end. You have to hold it up and blow it and let it bend. And it was used for, like on a boiling flask or an oil wire, it was cut off and stuck on the side for gas generation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've heard a lot of stories about who that might be. It's Lido. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. What he, a... was, he was quite the individual. Um, he didn't talk a lot. He spoke broken English. Uh, he would give me hand signals. You know, hey, I need a lighter on top. Yeah, I need it heavier on top. You know, and he would give you hand signals to point you in the right direction. But he was very smooth, very skilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how many years did you work for Corning? I worked for Corning from 1972 to about 19 in the 90s. Um, when the hand shops shut down, uh, late 80s, I uh, transferred to Stuben and then I transferred to research development. At that time, Kenny Goodrich and their crew were making the hub. Do you know what the hub is? Uh, it's what Corel wears made on. And I would gather gobs by hand, feed the rollers, and they would uh, test the machinery on a single station so they could make their molds. Mm -hmm. What did you do for um, Stuben? He said you worked there for I a while. I worked with a, with a gentleman who's retired from the service, Second World War, was a uh, B-25, waste, B-24, waste gunner, had made a bag, and uh, uh, we made figurines, vessels. Uh, one, of the, one of the main ones we made were uh, um, Revere Bowl, which I still believe was being produced. Um, yeah, he was a very skilled man. Um, as far as making animals, he had techniques that a lot of the people didn't see. He was very good. Mm -hmm. So what made you leave Stuben and go to research and development? Uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Stuben at that time was I could say clicky, but not clicky. It was the individuals who were there had only worked glass four to five years. And uh, they were quite upset with me because I had so much experience. And there was a lot of animosity. And when I saw an opportunity to go back and work with research development, I took it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So what else did you do with research and development? Um, I solved a couple jobs uh, that was with a glass called 866 LC. It was a body scan. When you go into a, a scanning machine, it had a lens on it. And this lens allowed it didn't filter the x-rays. Well, they had a lot of problem melding it because they're always in a hurry. 
And um, I went to one of the gentlemen that had a melding, who was my foreman, and said, why don't we try something? And he said, well, you know, we're not gaining any place. They're dumping the melts, dumping the melt, thousands of dollars. I said, why don't we cook that like we do a cake? Get it in there, bring it up temperature, back it off slow. And it turned out we turned 100%. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, you know, when I worked in the old factory, all the old men always spoke to me. I'd ask questions, and they were eager to communicate. It was quite the experience. Yeah. Especially yeah. as a young boy, I mean, to be uh, in a situation where you could make a difference. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you started working for Corning? I was 18. 18? Yeah. So that means you probably remember the flood pretty vividly. Yes, I was actually in Almara during the flood. Uh, I was, I grew up on the south side and my parents had moved to Horsets. Uh, when the flood started in about a fourth day of uh, rain, a friend of mine was going to school in Rochester, called me up and said, hey, I gotta go check on my family. I said, all right, I'm with you. So he showed up in Horseheads. We walked the railroad tracks all the way down through Elmar crossed the railroad bridge in the heights of the flood. Wow. Scary. I bet. I bet it was scary. <laughs> Thought we were going to get swept away. I can remember hearing the houses mm -hmm. hitting the bridges above us. Mm -hmm. It was a big noise. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. We ended up going across and uh, finding his family. They were safe. Mm -hmm. How about your family? They were. They were. Um, I had a sister who lived on Second Street in Elmar. Uh, she was on the second floor. They rescued her, and everyone was all right. My brother at that time was living in Illinois, so he wasn't in town. Yeah. yeah. He worked uh, also for Corning. He had worked for Ingersoll Milling, repairing machinery. And uh, I called him up one day, because I was a glass floor, and heard they were hiring machinists. He went to Pressware and got in their uh, machine shop. Ended up working his way up, became a manager for the machine shop at PRC. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah, he did very well. Yeah, yeah. So I know that you brought some um, some names with you. Uh, folks, yes. Did you did you want to mention them? I sure do. My first gaffer was uh, Clarence Whitehead. Mm -hmm. My second gaffer was Kenny Brockway. Uh, Brockway had a cousin who ended up becoming one of my bosses. His name was Bucky Brockway. Uh, when I left the hand shops and went to Ben, uh, I was told, come here, you know, go in the office, plan manager, here, you gotta read this. Uh, that's what I was telling you about R29. It was a working history of what you achieved, you know, or anything like that. Uh, Bucky Brockway had written two pages of admiration for my workmanship. That's nice. Yeah, I didn't expect it mm -hmm. because he and I always, you know, <laughs> seem to have different opinions. Mm -hmm. But no, he stuck up for me. Mm -hmm. 
I was very lucky. I also worked with Leonard Tazanowski, a big old Polish man, had worked the hand shops all his life, came from uh, Poland, hard worker, uh, another man named Joe Hamilton, very skilled man. You know how they work as to bend on the bench? Joe had the ability to work on the bench. See, we worked a different process. Well, we made things a lot faster. Um, borosilica becomes very stiff and workable in a short period of time, unlike lead glass. Mm. Right. You don't reheat borosilica. Mm -hmm. It turns it into a ceramic. Right, right. So did, was it a big adjustment for you when you had to go to Stuban? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, what was it like? I was in my glory. <laughs> that means I could reheat that, I could fix it. <laughs> right, right. The old man that, that I worked under, um, he warned me about what was going to happen. Uh, my coworkers would say, hey, come on, you want to go to lunch? And they would take me over on Baker Street. Three times they left me. Oh. And the owner of the place would say, get in, Steve, bring me back. And I'd always show up ahead of them. Yep, they were good hard workers, but they they just had a thing about, I had worked class over 10 years, and they'd only been in there four years. They were afraid that if I made the grade, mm -hmm. I would bump them. Right, right. Because we had the bump process. Mm -hmm. Yep. When the hand shops shut down, I went to Stuben. The plant manager asked me up to his office, asked me if I thought the individuals I had worked with had the ability to make Stuben. And I said, by all means. Well, they went through a big process to hold them off, which was sad because some of them were very skilled, hmm. very skilled. So but, why did they do that? I think it was jealousy, but mm -hmm. I mean, I cannot prove it. Right, right. So what other, did you have any other jobs at Corning? Um, yeah, I cleaned uh, horse heads in one summer. Mm -hmm. uh, the holding point ran a, a sweeper. One building one day, next building next day. Boring job. I had a supervisor that was always screaming and yelling. And uh, I remember having to go to him and apologize because I was learning adult. And uh, I had to tell him, I'm sorry, I misthought of you. Hmm. That must have been hard to do. Yes, but no. Mm -mm. I was brought up to respect your elders, mm -hmm. and I didn't. <laughs> so um, what year did you retire from Corning? Actually, I left Corning 1989, 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, the hand shops were shut down. Stuben and I did not meet eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And I was approached by Owens, Illinois. Oh. 
and I ended up going to Vineland, New Jersey, which Corning just bought because they made pharmaceutical wear also. Uh, I was offered a job and they said, do you have any apprentices? And I had two and I took them with me. Uh, I ended up working there another 19 years. Wow. So you've worked in glass quite a long time. Most of my life. Yeah, yeah. So then you you retired from Owens? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? Oh, uh, 1998, 99, mm -hmm. about, eh, just about 2000. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing. They sold out to Gushheimer. Mm -hmm. And when they sold out to Gushhammer, they held on to us for another six months and said if we turned 85 to 90 percent, they would keep the hand shops. They didn't. Mm -hmm. How was your experience working there different than for Corning? It was archaic. They were backwards. They didn't have technologies. Um, a lot of their engineering crew didn't work with the average man. Hmm. Uh, one thing I can say about Corning, if you ask the question, you got an answer. Mm -hmm. These people weren't like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any favorite memories from working there? Yes, uh, I had a plant manager who was selling products in the Carolinas to a pharmaceutical company. And when people would come through, I always made paperweights. I would always hold on, let them watch what we're doing, shut down, go get a paperweight, present it. Uh, at that time, we were making coffee pots for Black & Decker. And uh, it got so that every time I gave a paperweight, it was a different individual. The guys at Black and Decker used to argue about who's going to go get a paperweight. Because I always tried to make stuff. The plant manager called me in the office and said, Steve, I want to pay you to make paperweights. I was in my glory. I said, can I get a helper? Yes, by all means, anybody you want. So I took a young man, showed him what I needed to do. We go in on weekends, make apples, bananas, grapes, paperweights. And uh, I was paid high wages for it. He, uh, decided that he wanted to do the same as Corning, make it visible to the public. He used to bring his family in on Saturdays to show me off. <laughs> yeah, that was, um, then one Saturday I looked around, he was not there. He had died that previous night. But uh, the same as you have here at Steven was going to happen mm. in New Jersey. Mm. That's pretty neat. Yeah, I was exhilarated. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you've run into a lot of great opportunities over your career. I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So did you ever make things, the sort of end of the day things to bring home kind of stuff that we've heard different <coughs> factory workers made? Yes. Uh, we used to always, if somebody's getting married, we'd always uh, make something they could use. For example, at their wedding reception, we used to make uh, uh, mixers with stirs and glasses and give them as gifts. All the, uh, all the people, when they retired, 
Well, if we knew men like fishing, we'd make a paperweight mm -hmm. with a fish on the hook. <laughs> you know, things like that. Right. Always tried to uh, honor our people. Mm -hmm. I made uh, gavels for uh, judges, New York State Supreme Court. Uh, I made, oh, whenever I made paperweights, I always made sure my furnace operator, his family, got some. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, without them, I didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what have you been doing since you retired? Nothing. It's lazy. <laughs> Actually, I have a hard time relaxing. Yeah. Any glass work since then? I worked a little bit with uh, Rudy, who has a small mm -hmm. glass shop. Right. Uh, and it was all right, but I had to go on making a living and uh, of course she was paying me, but not what I was anticipating. I ended up going back and working the automotive trade because I had grown up in it. So I went back and did that. And then two years ago, I went back into uh, press wear and worked as a, a journeyman mechanic on the hubs because they were looking for skilled people who knew what the hub was about. And I, I did that for about a year and a half, but heck, I was 60 years old, working all night, you know. <laughs> I had enough. Yeah. So since then, what have you been up to? Well, fishing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So is there anything else about working in glass or in Corning or living in Corning that, that you it want was to share? A, it was one of the most unique experiences I ever had. Uh, the science, the technology. I mean, some of the things we made were just used in a lab, but some of the stuff we made better to everybody's life. Mm -hmm. Like what? Well, between the bakeware and, and the pharmaceutical stuff, uh, it saved people's lives. Right, right. I've always heard the biggest invention in glass was eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> and I wear a pair. <laughs> uh, I, I was there when the late part of uh, um, the military stuff was adjustable eyeglasses uh, to stop the sunlight, say in a desert or on the ocean, uh, Polaroid lens. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Uh, we made a lot of uh, aircraft, lens covers, Hughes aircraft. I worked on sight glass for F-11 bombers. Uh, when the man had to go to manual, he used that piece of sight glass to land that jet. A lot of stuff. Uh, worked on a project called Vicor. It was a glass that it was real rubbery. Uh, we would make beakers and other objects. They would take them, acid dip them. They would shrink one third their size. Wow. But then when they refired them, they put gold powder in them. That's how they pour your ingots. Huh. Interesting. Some very unique items. Uh, hand blown tubing. What a science. Um, they finally figured out a machine that did it automatic. But before then, any small orders come in, 
we were to actually manhandle it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was quite the trade. Mm -hmm. To pull a piece of glass 110 feet and it was perfect all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been something to see. Yeah. To be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Is there anything else that you want to uh, talk um, to us about today? Well, I'll tell you, I miss my old friends. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever see the, any of the Corning retirees group? Uh, most of them are gone. We worked in an environment that wasn't really 100% safe. We, I even gathered a radioactive class. Worked in the old pot furnace area. Uh, did a job. I said, how come we only got half a mill? Oh, just get it done. All right. I come in the next day, at 7 o'clock, get my coffee. There's these guys running around with radioactive suits oh. on. And I'm going, gee whiz, gentlemen, what are you doing? Oh, checking this batch. I was like, oh my God. Surprised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of good old men. They came all walks of life. Mm -hmm. A lot of them died young. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the Badge House, was very close to the blowing area. So when you worked, you go back from a break, coffee break or whatever, you had to wipe your equipment off because the, the door was open in the bathroom where they mixed and it would come out mm -hmm. and settle where you work. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But that was before the days of OSHA. Right, right. You know, I mean, we learned a lot more. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure it's very different now. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite products, of course, was glass tubing, but I really enjoyed blowing beakers and Earl Myers and filters and the shapes, um, it was ungodly the amount of shapes we made, especially out of Pyrex, because it was set up so quick, you could make them mm -hmm. that fast. Right, right. Hmm. Very unique. Do you remember when the, um, the formula for Pyrex changed from borosilicate to soda lime? No, it was after my time. Mm. Just curious. It's a question we're asked often, so I was curious. I imagine. I was. I know the patent went down like six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. and I worked before that for Kimball Glass. They had their own borosilica mix. It actually was a little more vibrant. It, it, it had a nice shine to it. Uh, Corning's borosilica tended to be used a lot of color. So it would have a little green or yellow tint to it. But the borosilica that uh, Kimball's made was very clear. It was a good glass, a little softer, but it worked approximately the same. Right, right. Hmm. Interesting. I can remember going to a plant manager. Well, you know, if, you know, I was telling you, if we can turn X amount of percentage, and uh, my next job was 50,000 boiling flask. And uh, he reached over and pulled one out of a box, set it on the counter. 
this is what we're fighting. I look at the box and I went, oh gosh. It was my old number. <laughs> I had actually made it. And here I was working for him. So I waited to after the whole meeting, went to him and said, hey, you know, that's one of my old pieces. <laughs> well, how do you know? That's my number. <laughs> because every time we did a product, it carried a sequence number so you could trace down any flaws. Corning had set up a very intelligent system. Um, I could go into the warehouse, look up, say, yep, that's mine. Nope, that's Joe's. Nope, you know. And they could recheck it or find a problem so that way you could fix it. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, Yes, I mean, for Corning, it right. had to be a, a landmark. Right, right. I mean, uh, that's why our scientific wear was top of the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So, anything else you want to share today? I don't believe so. No? But okay. if you ever have a bunch of questions, ask. Okay, well, thank you for coming in and talking with us. I'm glad to be Really here. appreciate it. Um, and had some great, great things to share with us for the uh, future. Hopefully, hopefully I'll get a chance to work some more glass here. Yeah. Um, I've been offered a couple spots. Yeah. And I was offered by a person from the city council an opportunity. I said, I'll take yeah, you. Yeah, that'll be great. Have he a little said, more time. would you teach him? I said, I'd be glad to. Yeah, that's great. Great. Great thing to look forward to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Instead of sitting on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for coming in today. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it.